talking about drying foods. And this presentation is so beautiful by uh, Miss Finnick from um, Springfield Center in Illinois. I haven't changed a thing. You're getting it just as she did it. She did a beautiful job. But I do need to remind you that this was paid for in part by USDA food dollars. And of course, that means we do not discriminate against anyone. Michigan State University Extension loves to have everybody in our community join us, and we do not hang out with those that do discriminate. So you can always be assured that you're in an equal opportunity situation when you come into MSU. So, how many people dry food? We have someone that's drying food even as we speak. I love this. This is an ancient, ancient art that fell out of favor, and I'm not really sure why, because it's inexpensive, it's easy to do, it takes next to nothing to hold on to, and the, and the shelf life is so long. It's a wonderful um, alternative to canning and freezing. It's a very safe um, food preservation method. Um, you could dry all year round, a little bit or a lot. You don't have to have a big garden to, to dry things. It doesn't take up almost any space. I've lived in a thousand square feet or less my entire life. So I can really appreciate the fact that it doesn't take up much space. How does it work? If you take out moisture, no life grows. Why is there nobody on the moon? There's no water. <laughs> There's not any air either, but the water is the big thing, okay? It slows down the action for enzymes. It doesn't completely inactivate them, but it makes them so slow that the shelf life is very long. Now, 140 degrees is the temperature that you need to dry at. At 140, DNA uncurls, denatures, and life as we know it ex cease to exist. If you get much higher than 140, you begin to cook instead of dry, okay? You don't really want to cook the food. You just want to dry it. Now, <laughs> my early attempts at food drying, case hardening, is when the outside looks really dry and the inside is still wet and then you get something that's hard on the outside and watery on the inside and moldy and icky. So in order to avoid case hardening, you have to use the right temperature with air for the right amount of time, lest things go bad. Do you have a question? It dip I think that you should be using the guidelines that are found on the National Center for F Home Food Preservation or from our friends at the University of Georgia, So Easy to Preserve. And you're really going to look out today because I'm going to give you this food preservation guide that's going to tell you a lot about what you need to know since you kind souls have come to spend this time with me, and not many people want to hear about drying, you're going to get a, a gift, okay? Now, low humidity is pretty necessary for drying. Air current, the more air current you have, the more evenly food dries, the quicker it dries. If you buy a commercial food dryer, they always have a fan, right? It's, it's not drying, it's cooking if you're in an oven. Now, you could dry food in the sun, you can, but you need 85 degrees and less than 65% humidity. Does that sound like anything that ever happens in Michigan? Now, if you were living in Arizona, you could probably dry outdoors pretty nice. Um, you can use an oven. You can use a food dehydrator. The sun drying, the, they're pretty safe with fruits. Uh, vegetables, jerky, cannot be done outside under any circumstances because you have to make sure that your temperatures are good. Um, you've got to cover your material and still let the air flow lest you have bugs in your dried apples. So when you look at the need to control for insects, to control for pests, to have the lower humidity for it, not to start raining in the middle of your drying session, drying outdoors in Michigan is really sort of food roulette. 
Now, I thought this was pretty clever right here. See this little gizmo right here? Has anybody ever worked in a restaurant? Do you know what this is? I think this person is a genius. This is a food rack that has trays that fit in these slots, and you can't really tell it good from this picture, but this is completely encased in screen. Oh. Isn't that fabulous? And they just set their trays. They redid their trays so that the trays were screens, not using a, a solid metal tray. So they, put, they rebuilt screened trays to go in here. I thought that was fabulous. Um, that keeps the bugs out, and it has nice airflow. And if it starts raining, we're on wheels here, so you can run out there and push it. Likewise, if you don't have a lot of sun in your yard, you can run around and, and push this into the sun all day. So I thought that that was about the grooviest homemade sun dryer I've ever seen. Um, on the website, on the www.kentnutrition.weebly.com website, I actually did give you plans for building a solar dryer if you'd like to build one. Um, there are plants there available to you. But again, you need to make sure that your food gets turned or is in completely um, an aerated situation and you need several days. Now, some things you can leave right on the vine to dry. Beans, lentils, soybeans, you just leave them until they dry. You don't have to do much to them. That's pretty easy, okay? But you do want to do a little pasteurization. You do want to, to guard against some... Um, bacteria and it's very easy to do but after you dry your food you just put them in the freezer and freezer bags for 48 hours whatever's left is is rendered um, harmless everything that anything that you dry if you put it in the freezer especially that's especially important um, for things that you've dry, dried outside but put it in the freezer or you could put it in the oven and preheat the oven uh, to 160 for lay it in there, just put it in the oven that's been preheated to 160. Now my oven doesn't go down to 160. This is the problem with oven drying. My oven only goes down to 200. So this is a problem. Um, indoors, you can buy a food dehydrator. There are some really good ones. This right here is the Cadillac of food dehydrators. If you'll see up here, it's got these two controls up here. That's going to let you select temperature, and it, one of these probably even lets you select speed of fan um, up here. You'll notice back, you can't see it really good, but the fan is in the very back of this so that the air blows across the trays like this. Why is that important? Because if you want to dry different food, if you wanted to dry um, mushrooms and blueberries, your mushrooms would come out tasting like mushrooms and your blueberries would come out tasting like blueberries, you wouldn't have blueberry mushrooms. Where in this gizmo right here, the fan is down here and it blows up through the top so the flavors blend. But if you're drying all one thing, so what? It's not a big deal. Now this one has on it a temperature gauge, which is really nice, but a lot of these lower end round food dehydrators do not. It's on and off. You can't control the fan, you can't control the temperature, and so you get less control, okay? Um, you, these trays, you could use as many or as few as you like, but the higher you build the tray, the longer it's going to take to dry, especially the ones on top. Where these, the air's coming this way, you have one tray in here, you fill it up, it doesn't make any difference. Um, small electric, they use almost no energy. They're extremely energy efficient appliance. Um, most foods will dry at 140. Some foods will have a different temperature. You need to look at a guide, a USDA approved guide. Some of these food dehydrators you can pick up at um, a resale shop. I think I bought mine for $5. I'm, I'm sure I spent, I spent way under $10 for it because I spent 10 and change and I had other stuff when I left there. Um, some can be really expensive. I've seen some in the $250 range. I've seen them in the $40 and under or used very, um, very inexpensive. They do have limited capacity. You can't dry um, a half bushel of tomatoes at once. And if anybody has purchased sun-dried tomatoes, you realize how um, expensive those are, what a great thing it would be to dry some tomatoes for yourself. But if you are a home gardener and you have a small garden, that limited capacity is actually a, a gift instead of a curse. But it is small capacity. You can't do bushels of things at once and it takes a while to dry. Most drying times, six, eight, ten hours or more. 
The double wall construction is nice if you're looking to buy one. Countertop, the enclosed thermostat is nice. They should all have fans or blowers. Most will only come with a one year guarantee, but it has been my experience that they last for a long time. Um, this is nice. If you have one with a timer or an auto, auto shut off, those are really nice. Um, if you're going to be gone for the weekend or whatever, but then nobody's home to check it, right? I just told you about the horizontal versus the vertical airflow. Oh, I forgot to tell you about this too. You can have drips because some of the things that are like blueberries, if you're going to dry blueberries, they can drip down on the thing below it. If it's just blueberries, it's no big deal, but if it's, you know, something else, you might not want that. Now, a few years ago, I bought myself a convection oven because I thought this thing is going to be so cool because I'm going to be able to dehydrate in my convection oven, right? So I get home, and I didn't research as well as I should have. And first of all, the oven temperature didn't go down low enough. And second of all, when you oven dry, you need to leave the door open. Think about it. The gas to run a convection oven with the door open, I can go buy something dried cheaper than I can do that, right? So that didn't work quite as well. Now, you wouldn't think this, but it actually takes longer than in a dehydrator. So in August, do you really want to leave your oven door open? You can put, place your oven door open, place a fan in front of it if your oven goes down to 140, but you're looking at a lot more energy use. Your house is going to get hot. Um, you really need to have a thermometer inside of your oven, not just use what's the gauge, what's on the outside when you're drying with an oven, because you need to make sure that it's at least 140. When it starts dropping below 140, you're not denaturing protein. Um, you're not in a safe place. You also cannot fill the oven completely full. You need to have a few inches around because airflow has to go around the trays. Room drying. This is one of my favorites. I've got herbs hanging all over my house right now because mine came in early this year. Hot peppers too. Very easy. All you have to do is string them, put them in a pa paper bag, punch some holes in the paper bag, hang them, dry them. In two weeks you will have beautiful dried herbs that you would pay premium price for at the store. You could squish the bag like this with your hands. All of it will fall to the bottom and you don't even make a mess. One, two, three. It's a great 4-H project. Home drying herbs. Very easy. Drying fruit. Where I messed up the first time I dried fruit is the first one thing I didn't do is, is I didn't crack, I didn't check the fruit, I didn't crack the skin on blueberries. There's no way it's going to dry, right? It's in there. What's happening? It's like six weeks and my blueberries aren't dried. Well, you need to, to crack the skin of, of, of whole fruits like cranberries, blueberries, strawberries. Um, so that was um, a problem that I did. You want to do uniform slices. So if you have thick slices and thin slices, you're going to have to really watch and take some out, leave some in. That's pretty important. Um, some fruit can be done whole like the berries, but again, you have to, to check it. Pre-treating fruit, I've done this too. Apples that aren't pre-treated don't look really good. They're safe, they're not unsafe. But if you have issues, if you're a visual eater like I am, brown apples were not tempting at all. They didn't make it into the trail mix that year. So it really is worth your time to simply pre-treat the fruit and I'm a big fan of, of these um, fruit fresh or, or ascorbic acid, citric acid preparations. You buy them in the store, they're a buck and a half, they tell you how much to use. They're very easy, you dip and dry, it's so easy. You can use any of these other things, um, but they leave a lot of leeway in how good your product's gonna turn out. So I'm really a fan of just buying one of these. If you wait too late in the season, there won't be any left for you to buy, though. You can get them at Meyer. You can get them at, I doubt Walgreen would sell them, but at any good food store. If they, if they sell canning jars, our Riley's Ace Hardware down the street here has a great canning and, and food preservation section. Of canning fruit, the, the thing that's hardest, it's very easy. Single layer, follow the directions, start with the, the given drying times. 
But the hardest thing is you have to watch the time on your fruit. You have to pay attention to it. How are you going to know when fruit's got 20% moisture? <laughs> That's why you have to watch. And what you do is you cut the pieces in half. No visible moisture. You shouldn't be able to squeeze any moisture. Fruit shouldn't be sticky if it's dry. It should be dry to the touch. When it's folded in half, it shouldn't stick to itself. Let Here's one I did too. After you dry something, let it cool. Let it cool thoroughly before you put it into bags or you will get condensation. Condensation is water. Water is not the friend of dehydrated fruits and vegetables. So avoid condensation by being sure you let your fruit cool really well before you pack it or your vegetables. Conditioning, this is a great way to make sure you've done a good job with your fruit. You equalize the moisture. You put what you dried in a large jar. Some people use plastic. I like glass jars. Leave it in there for seven to ten days. Shake it, the jar, the plastic, every so often. And if there's no moisture inside, there's no condensation inside the bag, it's beautiful, ready to go, store it. If there is condensation, you need to put it back to be dried. If it started to mold, you have to start all over again. Vegetables, again, uniform pieces. Vegetables you really want to dry as soon as possible after picking for best flavor. You need to pre-treat vegetables by blanching. You can do it in water, you can do it in steam. Put the vegetables in boiling water for one minute. Take them out, lay them out. No, we actually want to cool them. Take them out, cool them in, in an ice bath, and then lay them out, pat them dry before you. You want to be sure to pat them dry before you um, dry them. Done that one too. I forgot to pat dry. That's another way to extend your drying time by six or eight more hours. So you really want to pat dry before you put your um, vegetables in there. You can also steam blanch if you like. I'm going to do it above the water. Your choice. You do really need to cool the vegetables and wipe the vegetables. Some vegetables will get really, really brittle. Fruit never will get very brittle. Even apples don't get brittle. Bananas will get the most brittle of all. But some vegetables will be, like mushrooms, will just shatter. When you, when you break them. Only 10% moisture for them. They don't need conditioning like fruits do. You don't have to put them in the jar. They don't have as high water content to start out with. Fruit leathers. One of my personal favorites, these are not the same thing as the fruit snacks you buy in the store. The fruit snacks you buy in the store are sugar water with coloring and fruit flavor. This is real fruit. And you can even use canned fruit frozen fruit. You don't even have to use fresh fruit for this. So what's is so nice about this, you don't have to add any sweetener to it if you don't want. Um, if you don't have enough fruit, you can add a little apples, applesauce to it to extend it. All you need to do is puree your fruit and add your uh, ascorbic acid or your commercial product. You pour it. Now on these, on your dryers, you're going to come with, or you'll have to buy additionally if you want to do fruit leathers, it's a solid either ring for the round dryers or a flat, like a plastic mat that sits on the top of the trays or your puree would seep through, right? Um, see what I'm talking about for oven? 18 hours to make fruit leathers. Now that would be some expensive fruit leathers, okay? Eighth of an inch thick, dry at 140. When you don't get any more indention in the center of the level, you're good, but you need to peel it while it's warm. If you wait till it's cool, it doesn't want to roll. It doesn't want to peel. Done that one too. You want to, you want to peel it while it's still warm. These don't stay at room temperature as long as other dried products do because they still have a pretty high moisture content. These you want to freeze. If you're not going to use them up within a month, you can freeze them. They don't take up much room though. Jerky. You have to be very careful, especially if you're doing a wild game. You have to freeze them at zero degrees for at least 30 days to kill a trichinella. It's a parasite. You got to worry about E. coli too. So you need to be heating the meat, heating it in marinade. That's an acid that will help um, kill bacteria. 
You really have to use a thermometer. You have to get this to 160. You have to if you're doing jerky. Um, once you've got it dried, it needs to go into the, um, an oven for 10 minutes and a preheated 275. You still want to make sure that your internal temperature is 160. And, you know, people think that you could put jerky on the shelf forever and ever. You can't. you got a couple of weeks, and then you have to freeze it because, again, its moisture content is higher, and it's a protein food. The jerky that you see in the store that's out on the shelf for a long time, that is vacuum sealed in sterile conditions. That's why you can do that. It's aseptic um, storage. Freezing is a little bit harder than drying. Canning is a little bit harder than freezing. Drying is by far the least difficult um, food preservation technique to experiment with. You can experiment in small quantities. You could do fruit. You could do vegetables. You could do fruit leathers. There's nothing that that isn't up for grabs for drying. Tomatoes, if you use a meatier tomato like Aroma, it's going to dry better than a real juicy one. If you seed your tomatoes, you'll get a, a, a better product than if you leave the seeds in. Um, peppers, I mean, how much do you pay for a, a small container of dried red pepper flakes? That's what, about $3.50 to $4 at the store? For $4, you can buy a lot of pepper plants, and you could be giving pepper flakes to everybody you know for the next three years. The shelf life is great, and I would really encourage you, if you've never tried to dry anything, to try to dry something, especially if you can either pick up a dehydrator used at one of the thrift stores, or if perhaps you would like to um, have a community dryer, have two or three people in your neighborhood go in together, buy a dryer and share it, and then you can flip for who has to make room to store it, if you live in small houses like we do. Does anybody have any questions about drying? Yes, ma'am. For drying herbs, about how long does that take when you're hang drying them? When you're drying herbs, if you're going to hang dry it in your paper bags, it could take usually, depending on the humidity in your house, two to three weeks. If your house is really dry and you've got ceiling fans going on, it could be in less than two weeks. So it doesn't take a really long time. You do want to put it in a paper bag. I see people hang their herbs up to dry, and those look real pretty. But you know what? Dust. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes. And you walk by, and you've got, you've got uh, uh, herb showers. And also light. It's the oil in the herb that produces the flavor. The light that those are being exposed to is, is degrading the quality of the herb. So it's really much better to put it in a brown paper bag with holes punched in it. Just a hole puncher. Just a hole puncher. That's a great um, activity for um, a child. Have them punch 40 or 50 holes in a lunch bag. Put the herb in, tie it with twine. I do recommend that you tie with twine um, or a rubber band, not use metal because as the herbs shrink, sometimes they'll fall out of like a, a twist tie. If you use a twist tie, they'll fall out. So the twine and the rubber band seems to work really good for not falling through. Any other questions about drying? Peaches. Have you been able to slice them thinly? I think you're over drying. I think you're over drying, too drying. Okay. So whatever you're doing, I would back. How, do you know how many hours you're doing your peaches for? Uh, no, I, I'm not going to get it confirmed yet. I would check them at six hours. I would, I would, depending on how thin you slice them. Now, some varieties of peaches are really juicy, and some are not. Like Loring peaches are super juicy. Uh, Red Havens are not as juicy as Loring, so it depends on your peach variety. You can ask your farmer. You know, uh, uh, what's the juicy scale here? On a scale of 1 to 10, how juicy is this peach? <laughs> and if they say, this is a super juicy peach, you might want to start at about um, 10 hours. If it's not, start at 6 to 8 and check it. Is your color been good for your peaches? Too dark, then you probably need to pre-treat. Slice thinner, pre-treat, and don't let it go quite so long. It's not reliable. I don't think you, I would. I would use. I would try a commercial ascorbic acid solution because different. Again, different pineapples, even different lemons have different acidity levels that are not going to be consistent. So if you use them, 
Some will work really great, the next time it won't. If you want to use lemon juice, use the bottled lemon juice because they test the pH of that. You can use that, but you never know. Also, pineapple juice has got bromelain in it, which it, usually it works on protein, but it can sort of break a product down. So that may be why your peaches have that, those little things popping up. Any other questions on drying? What about any food preservation questions in general? Freezing or canning? The the Weebly site will have all the food preser well the information will be left on the food preservation tab until after the season is over. So probably until November first. I'm okay. going to leave the food uh, preservation. That's good. that's good to know because if you run an Idaho or a Kentucky report, at least you'll have a month after that. Yes, and if yes, I'm going to leave it up at least until November okay. first because there's still there's winter squash that can be processed. There will be things later in the season, apples, and different things later in the season that people may still be processing. So yeah. food preservation tab will be available that long. They're not cold enough when they go in. Uh, you blanch them, correct? Uh -huh. Ice water bath them, and dry it. I would put them in the refrigerator okay. and then pack them because when you get crystals, that's telling me either there's too much moisture or they're too warm, creating some condensation, making moisture. Okay. So it's either too wet or too warm, one okay. or the other. And can I refrigerate them just on a tray? Just on trays, fine. And what I do a lot of times is I will take one tray, because again, I have a smaller refrigerator, and I'll just put layers of uh, wax paper. So I can put several layers of what I want to freeze on one tray, because I don't have room for six trays in my refrigerator. Mm -hmm, yes, a cookie sheet works great. Baking pan works great. I'll tell you what I found out this um, weekend. I was trying to cut corners when I was canning um, green beans. And I decided I didn't want to let the dial gauge go all the way down to zero before I took uh, the device off the top that would let the steam flow out. And when you do that, you know what that does? It makes all the fluid come out of your jars. So you're really not saving any time. So there is a reason why you let the gauge come down all the way to zero before you remove the top on the um, pressure canner that would allow the steam to vent. Thought I'd share that with you, because now I've got a Now I've got um, ten pints of green beans that I'm going to be eating very shortly, <laughs> that I wasn't planning on. Yes, you can actually, if you've cut it off the cob, you don't have to blanch corn. It'll be okay. If you're on the cob, you do. That saves a lot of time. You don't have to blanch corn on the cob. Can you still get great freshness? It will say now. Keep in mind that's going to cut your sh your your storage time, so you're not going to get a year out of it, but you're probably going to get six months out of it. So you could save a lot of time that way. I want to show you um, a, a new gizmo that I got in the mail from our friends at Ball Canning. This is a new device, ball canning. The people that do the ball blue book have put out a new home canning starter kit. And this is the new um, smaller version of a basket and jars that will fit in almost any spaghetti stock pot that will allow you to can a smaller amount at once. So you could do just three salsa or you could do just three um, jelly and I really loved this. This is lots more stable than I thought. I wasn't going to promote it until I took it in and I did it. I submerged it in boiling water. I filled the jars. I pulled it out. It's really nice when you put the lid on the the um, pot. This squishes down. It's a great little gizmo. It works fine and I think it's a great way to start if you only were going to can three. That's a lot less intimidating than canning nine or twelve, right? Also takes less energy to bring a smaller pot to boil. Um, it takes a lot of energy to bring a 23-quart canner to boil.
not so much for a small stock pot that we do. I just really loved that. I thought that was a great new product that they've come out with. And um, there are coupons out on the table if you would like for this. I think it's called Canning Home Discovery Guide that you can purchase, and it comes with some different things. But the point is, is you can do canning on any level that you want. You don't have to do large-scale canning to be effective. Any other questions for food preservation? And how does that work? If you've got a recipe that makes a whole lot, is it all right to cut your recipe? You may not cut your recipe. Recipes That's may not be cut. So if you have a recipe that makes a lot, you would have to do two batches. Or two different pots. Yes. So, or you could, uh, or you could can part and freeze part, okay. or can part and share part have part fresh. Cool. But you should not cut recipes That's in half. That's what I remember. You shouldn't double them. You shouldn't reduce them. They are as they are. That's it. They are as they are. And the new ball blue book does have recipes for smaller um, canning that just came out this year. It's a beautiful new book with lots of new recipes worth exploring. Different sauces, different pickles. A really nice book. Anything else? Well, I hope you folks enjoy this wonderful bounty that we are having, and we'll um, preserve some food for the winter, and then you can say to your friends, na 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 I have these peaches, okay? <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Next month, I'll send an email and let you know what we're talking about. And with air conditioning like I can do now. In fact, I just did some canning this weekend. Today we're going to be talking about drying foods and this presentation